I've got, got so, so, sort of a general theme to talk to you about. And I'm, I'm always sort of a bit nervous about the after lunch sessions because you're all sort of carved up and a little bit sleepy. So I'm going to try and sort of talk a little bit about um, design in its broadest sense, then hopefully focus on a, on, on a couple of takeaways. And I kind of done a lot of consulting work with companies around design and, 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 the, and the D word, and it's in its heyday at the moment. And so I thought I, I would title this section, um, we tried design once, it didn't work. And there's a number of companies I've worked with that, that that's exactly how they sort of called us in. And things that have always sort of interested me in that is, um, well, you need to try it again and, and again. And so how do you do that? How do you make that commitment? And some of it is about how do you coach it through? So that coaching word, I think, is really important. So I just want to sort of seed that backdrop thought for you. Um, and then just sort of try and contextualize. So, so we, we know in the world that, that pe people are chasing design. We know that there's huge investment in design. There's national agendas. So Korea is building a huge agenda around design. The UK has done enormous work. New Zealand, Australia, everyone is looking at design. But we don't really know what it is. And we don't, re don't tell anyone that that is a big secret. Um, but we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to sort of actually look at what are the places that we can intervene with design. And so I wanted to touch upon some of those and just give you some, some places where you can also take design back. Because what I want to try and get across, the key keynote of the speech really, is that design isn't something we do to things. Design is a way of doing things. So how do we embrace some, some of those things? And then locate it for you and your specific business. So I do want to start the talk by saying generalizations are going to follow. I'm going to make some very, very broad statements. Um, the devil is always in the details, but I think within those broad statements, hopefully the various audiences can find their way in and try and make sense of, of design in, in that sense. So a lot of design is being linked to creativity. And we keep saying we need organizations to be more creative. In fact, if you look at every OECD, World Bank, United Nations, the biggest thing that the world is linked for is more creativity. Yet we never really talk about what we mean by it. So if we're trying to be more creative, how can you be more creative if you don't know what it is? And so some of the work, especially when, when we think about design and the arts, we always go to the arts and advertising is one of the key places that we think about design playing a role for your business. And I want to talk a little bit about that, but I also want to try and move it from just being about something that's done to sell your organization to something that you can embed in the way that your organization works and thinks. So how can we be more of something if we don't actually know what it is? So I think for each of you, the encouragement is to think about what design means to you and your organization. And then to think about how you can do more of it and where the creativity is. You don't need to be creative about everything. And so being very purposeful about creativity and being very purposeful about design is really important. Um, the other word that we also don't really think about too much is innovation. But we're also being told to be more innovative. And we use these words interchangeably, yet we don't really know what they mean. So how do we make sense of what they mean? How do we locate them? Um, so I want to try and make some sense of this by talking about three things that we're also conflating in with creativity and innovation. And that's invention, innovation, entrepreneurship. And this is sort of my way of trying to um, locate creativity and locate some of the design activity in a business sense. Um, so invention. So if you think about invention, most of you would, are familiar with inventors. Anyone not familiar with an inventor? So that idea of an inventor, if we think about it from a personal perspective, the personality of an inventor, if you will think about this invention, it's the bringing into life. So when you think of inventor, what sort of people do you think of? What stereotypes do you have in your mind? Einstein? Einstein? Edison. Edison. Yep. Yeah. Dyson. It's, it's really interesting because um, they're predominantly male, which is all, always intriguing. Um, but they're also boffins. They're also people that are deeply interested in the thing. They're really quite nerdy. And so when you think of Edison, you think of Dyson, the, these are all people that are very interested in the detail of things. So that notion of an inventor, I think we all have a reasonable take on what we mean by that. Einstein is the one that, that comes up frequently, and it is this sort of slightly crazy boffin in 
the garage or the shed tinkering away. So inventors are typically tinkerers. They're the ones that are under the hood. Um, when we think of innovation, who, who do you think of? What sort of personalities in innovation? Steve Jobs. What's really interesting is, so if you go to Peter Drucker and you study innovation, the key, key thing about innovation is it's a social term. It's not an economic term. So innovation is, is about the taking up of ideas. It's about getting ideas across. And a lot of innovation is actually about people in theater. And so Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs was absolutely brilliant on stage when he would present some of the objects. He would pull out the first MacBook Air from a manila envelope, or he would pull out the iPod from his jeans pocket. And that theater, that understanding of how consumers relate is a very different type of creativity to an inventor. And so when an inventor is actually into the details of things, an innovator isn't. An innovator is looking at people and trends and social trends. So that innovation is really important. Um, and when we think of entrepreneurship, what do we think of? What sort of people? Bear in mind, we use this word enormously at the moment. Yeah. This, so, so some of the original places where this word has come from was, is from the French, like most things seem to, um, or the Greeks. And it's the person that would put on shows. So it was the risk taker of shows. So this was the person that would do all the advertising and they would put theatre and shows on. So the entrepreneur was the financial risk taker who would make the event happen. So some of the things that, that we're talking about... Um, there are different points of focus for these people. So the inventor is detail-oriented. And I'm, once again, grossly generalizing. That detail interest of how things are made are not necessarily the same characteristics to someone that's going to understand society or the audience or the market. Because that innovation step, so just because you've invented it, doesn't mean that anyone's using it. Just because someone's using it doesn't mean you're making any money from it. So these are quite distinct activities, and it's not clear which order they come in, and it's not clear whether you need to be all of them. And in fact, it's very rare to find someone that is all of them. James Dyson is one of the few. It's, it's literally sort of a handful of people who are the inventor, the innovator, and the entrepreneur. So what that implies is with these sort of different cultures and different ways of working, in your organization, you've got these different creativities playing out. You've got these different personality types that you have to deal with. So it does require skills around collaboration. It does require skills around how do you get people to have these conversations when one wants to get right into the code of it, the other wants to get into the market of it, and the other person wants to get into the books and the dollars and the investment and the leverage. How do you have those conversations? So that ability to actually converse across is where design can play a role. And to also think about, you don't always get it in one person. It's rare to get that. So let's not expect everyone to do all three. So partnering is deeply important. So that multi-stakeholder view of creativity has to be encouraged. And certainly at school, that's what we're trying to work on. So yes, you need to be the inventor as the artist or the designer. But you also need to think about audience. You need to think about galleries. You need to think about where you retail your work. So you need to learn those languages and those bridges and how you, how you work across. What's really interesting about James Dyson, so Dyson, um, serial inventor. So I mean, he's done an enormous number of things, done wheelbarrows, done flat bottom boats, and vacuum cleaners, kind of what, what he's really known for. So he saw this cyclonic way of collecting, of moving air, made this vacuum cleaner, didn't really sell. So as the inventor, he did all of the hard work as the engineer in it. He did all of the technical work to make this object function beautifully. No one really believed it. And it was when he made the case clear that people could see the dust being collected. And the object started selling. So from an innovation perspective, this is nothing to really do with anything of the technical working of the vacuum cleaner. But you could now see the dust being collected. So he would vacuum after someone had just used another vacuum cleaner and you would see this dust flying around. And it was that little social step, that little human thing that made the sales really take off. So you don't really know what part of the invention is gonna trigger with people, what the real importance is. Did he think this through? He stumbled onto it. 
So I think the other thing is about the risk taking of the creative in that and trying things out. But there's also an insight. So when he was talking to the customers, um, that moment when it struck him that actually if they could see the dust, they would actually buy the vacuum cleaner because then I could show how much is picking up. So innovation is in that sort of strange area and this does go back to creativity, insight and how do we spot these signals that we're seeing. Um, and in a network society now, we do have access. So if you are an entrepreneur, you don't need to be the inventor. You can actually find inventors out there. But it's hard to separate invention, innovation and entrepreneurship in the mind of creativity, in the mind of design. So I think some of that discipline we need to come back to. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot being said about human-centered design. Um, and so, so, so some of the concerns I have around this, and this is just sort of a stream of consciousness in some respects. Whenever we do human-centered design, we always talk about the human as if we're all the same. So how do we actually start differentiating so we're not thinking about the human? I mean, if you just look around the group here, none of you are average. Yet we're going to design for you as if you're average. So how do we actually get much more specific? How do we actually talk about a real form rather than idealized form? Because most of the design work that we do is we idealize ourselves. And of course, there's a lot of this goes on in the media industry. But when we start designing, we we're, some of you might be on the left. Most of us are on the right. So how do we design for a real human? How do we design for a multivariable human? How do we make sense of that? And so giving ourselves permission to be very, very real in people and getting into very specific spaces. But then trying to understand how those people think is, is the, then the next challenge. Um, this is a very, very brief exercise about mental models. Um, so when we generalize about people, we just assume that they all think like us. And they don't. So all of us have a different way of looking at the world. Even if we're brought up in the same family, in the same city, we're going to think very differently. So the way we have become who we are is really governed by so many things. It is nature and nurture at the same time. So there's a real world out there. We get some information feedback from the real world. We then make some decisions that then go and impact back on the real world. So that's first loop learning. This is Chris Argyris's work. So that first loop learning most of us are familiar with. And we just assume that all humans are going to think like that. So when we get into human-centered design, we just think that this is the way that everyone thinks. And we can't understand why people think differently. And so when it comes to voting, how is that going to play out? People are going to think very differently to each other. Underneath that, Chris Idris argues that there's some decision rules that we all have. And they have been really created over time by our own mental models of the world, which have come from our own information and feedback. So all of your mental models are actually different. They will be completely dependent on your upbringing, your family, your religion, your beliefs. Yet we never really take that into account. And so if we're trying to make sense of this human-centered world, A, let's make it much richer than the bland, idealized one. But let's also think about the individuals and then how we can generalize from the specific. Part of the problem with this is we never talk about it. We never really get into finding out about people. And there are design tools for this. I'm not going to do a class on that, but there are design tools where designers can actually help unpick how we make sense of people's mental models, how they approach um, interaction of design, etc. So, because of those mental models, people have a complete different outlook. So, even though I'm up here dancing my flower, I can guarantee all of you will be taking something completely different. And so, in terms of education, education we used to think in the 50s and 60s that basically you were all empty vessels, we would come in, flip your head open, we would pour in information, and you would get it. We don't believe that's true at all. All of you will be translating that information to yourself. You will all be taking on, and with your own mental models, making completely different sense of what's being said. So I can guarantee when we leave this room, all of you will have a completely different interpretation of what's been said, which is kind of frightening when you're the speaker, but it is part of the reality that you're all going to have your own sense making. It's going to be dependent on your context, what you want to do, what pushes your buttons. 
And so how do you, in your own business, make sense of you broadcasting information or narrowcasting information? How do you get specific and general at the same time? This is, um, so I've done a lot of branding work, and this is an advert from 1958, and it's by John Peebles, creative director, and it's uh, an advert for McGraw-Hill, and it's one of my sort of favorite all-time ads. I'll just read what it says on the left. So it's a cl classic sort of American mid-century um, CEO. I don't know who you are. I don't know your company. I don't know your company's product. I don't know what your company stands for. I don't know your company's customers. I don't know your company's record. I don't know your company's reputation. Now, what was it you wanted to sell me? And so thinking about how you present your organization has an enormous impact on what people think about you and your values. And yet we don't really think about this until we get to the stage where you need a business card at a trivial level or you need a website or even how you interact with people. And so thinking about how you are presenting yourself in this relationship with your customer requires you to do quite a lot of soul searching about your own values. People just don't buy products anymore. They buy relationships. So they want a values match. They want to be able to like you. Nike can tell the world that they believe in runners, etc. But actually what we see is cheap labor. So how do you manage some of those brands? Because you don't own your brand, the customer does. You can say what you like, but it's the way those brands are taken up. And once again, mental models are going to come into play. So just as a very trivial example, um, bear with me. Imagine you've been offered a job by three companies and the conditions are the same, the salary is the same, the location is the same. The first company is represented by Piet Mondrian. Second company is represented by Jackson Pollock. Third company is re represented by Picasso. How many of you would work for Mondrian? How many of you would work for Pollock? It's slightly crazy. How many of you would work for Picasso? So these decisions you've all made based on some interpretation of, of, of that image. Now, if it was an airline, who would fly Pollock Airlines? <laughs> and yet you've all made an assumption, something about the airline, that this airline is going to behave in a certain way because of your interpretations of your own mental models of that. And what if you got into that airline when you got in there and Picasso Airlines, uh, Mondrian Airlines actually look like this? So in terms of thinking through how you present yourself to the world, what it says about your values and how people take that up, and then how you organize the organization, how you design your organization to actually deliver to those values. These are all design decisions. These are all decisions that you can make about your own organization. So I'm jumping around, I'm trying to give sort of a, a scattershot approach of where design can play a role. This is the work of um, Larry Greiner. It's, it's actually from 1972. It's a very old piece of work he did at Harvard. It's a phenomenal piece of work. Um, he talked about business growth, and he was really looking a, a lot at the motor industry. Motor industry is one of the industries that's going th gone through these growth spurts much better than others. And what he said was that when companies grow, they get to these positions where there is a crisis of something, and then they have to change direction. So the first stage of, of company growth, especially in the entrepreneurial stage, is of course it's through leadership. It is through that passionate person who's got the insight and they're gonna grow their organization. Then quite often that person is not the best person to take the company to the next growth stage. So there's usually a crisis of leadership. And if the companies are growing at the far scale of some of the Silicon Valley companies, some of this doesn't get realized until significantly further down the growth stage and then we start seeing some of the collapses we're seeing. So the first growth is through, through creativity. It is through creativity of the individual. It's usually because that individual is a maverick and an inventor and an innovator. But they're usually making it up as they go along. Then they get to a certain stage where they need to rethink and they need to put some structures and organization in place. So the next growth stage really comes through direction that they start actually having to direct people because it's no longer that small organization. Then they get a crisis of autonomy because people then get stifled. So the next growth comes through some sort of freeing up of decision making so we then start passing decision making down. So organization designs changes and you get a growth through delegation. You start having business sectors in there. 
Then, of course, you get the crisis of control because people feel that the sector is now competing against each other and you get a completely different crisis. And so the crisis of red tape then comes in. So these different phases of growth of organization, it's really interesting when we get to, and you've probably seen it in your own lives where companies that are centralized, decentralized, and they're decentralized, they centralize. So what does design do in these areas? And design plays a very different role depending on your organization. So for me to sort of um, give you a generic feel of how design could work in your organization, I kind of feel it's important to know what maturity the organization's at. And so maturity in context and the type of growth you're looking for will also govern the type of design that you need. So some of the design when you are through in the delegation role is about how you communicate policies, how you communicate processes and structures. Some of the design that's further down about uh, leadership, etc., does become about personality. So the conversations change quite significantly. So trying to make sense of that in a more generic way to give, give, give some tools across, there, there are a number of ways where you can choose to innovate in an organization. So thinking about the designed business, because that is also a design process, you are going to make decisions. So business design, the way you set up your organization is a way of really thinking about design from an organizational perspective, but also linking it to strategic partnerships. These are all decisions that you're going to make. So thinking about design, not just about things, but in the way that you want to work. There's a whole lot of work around process design. This is all very well understood. Um, and there's a lot of engineering design that goes into some of those aspects. But the processes, in the, I would argue there are two types of processes. One are the vigilant processes, which are about getting things done. And we all need those. We need a big percentage of things to run smoothly, especially with ISO 9000 quality control, we want to make sure we deliver that. So what are our processes for compliance, for want of a better word? Then there are other processes which are eager processes, which encourage new ideas. And if the balance isn't right and you're over eager and not vigilant, you could end up dropping the ball. If you're over vigilant and not eager, you could end up not innovating. So that balance in those processes is really important. And that requires some sort of oversight from the chief executive. It requires some cultural conversations. Then, of course, and this is where we've usually focused, is in the design of the offering. And I purposefully use the word offering because it doesn't have to be an object. It could be a service. So Airbnb, for example, the design of that offering is deeply thought through. But it's not the only place that design plays a role. Because when we get to the delivery system as well, this is where there's a huge opportunity for new design. If you think of logistics in particular, or you think about the way your brand or service is being communicated, maybe there are other ways to do it. People quite frequently, especially in that startup mode, and I'm just seeing it in our students, they all go and make bookmarks. Bookmarks is not a good delivery system in my mind, but from a design perspective, it's really easy to achieve. So then thinking about, well, what is this bookmark going to do? And it's about light marketing in some respects. The other big area that this really um, can't be underestimated is responsibility. And some of this goes back to that values that we want to work with companies that we have a similar value resonance. So responsible design, the ethical dilemmas of design, how can we actually think about those aspects, the way you get your equipment made, the way that you treat your employees, the way you think about sustainability in the environment, all these are making decision-making much more complex than we've seen. This is the work of uh, Doblin Group. Um, and it's a particularly nice landscape for innovation. So uh, what Doblin argued was that there are 10 places for you to innovate. Very few companies will innovate in all those places. So don't feel obliged to innovate in all of them. Companies that innovate in two or three of these landscape positions are the ones that are doing radical innovation. Now, once again, from a design perspective, at the front end, the profit model. You can redesign the profit model. Is it a share? Is it a strategic partnership? So thinking about design in that sector, perhaps that's where you innovate. Perhaps it's in the networking and the strategic alliances that you're collecting. So if you are going to set up an alliance with UPS, for example, maybe those are ways that you can actually broaden your network. You don't need to do all of it. Um, the structure of the organization, um, the processes, we've talked a little bit about product performance, product system. Once again, this is where we think that design has a role. And so my argument to you is actually there are eight other places that we should be looking. Um, service, 
service is a huge one. Um, we keep separating product from service, and I think that blurring needs to happen. It says a lot about you. So going back to the airline example, if the airline, if you phone the airline and the airline is saying our customer is king, you are the most important person to us, but then you phone them up and you're held on an answer phone for an hour, all of that rhetoric falls down. So trying to think through each one of those um, touch points. The channels, the brand, so that loyalty, people want relationships now. It is weird, even in sanitary products, people want a relationship. So branding is becoming even more important. Um, the other thing that we're, we're seeing is networked economies. Um, so it's so another theme I just wanted to throw out, especially thinking about the, the audience. Um, when the, when this, um, William Morris was around and it was really about the industrial revolution and the responses back and the arts and crafts movement was really coming back. This whole notion of the artist and the artisanal economy, the crafts people that were making objects. The industrial revolution was completely against that. So in this sort of giant economy that was driven by these industrial behemoths that needed massive energy, that needed big numbers of people to make the things that we were selling. The artists got lost, the artisans got lost. Now we have an economy that's much more networked and much more connected. And when we think of artisanal economies, unfortunately living here and being close to Vermont, we normally think of cheese and ice cream. But there's a whole load of things about the artisan economy. Etsy now is over a billion dollar industry. Amazon have started to do a lot more of artisan selling. So you as an individual in this network world can sell your own products direct to a customer. So that ability of actually networking economies is also a huge opportunity for you to rethink about mass customization, about routes to market, just thinking about how individual items can be made for specific audiences. Um, this is an example of a company in New Zealand called Icebreaker. So Icebreaker have really embraced this idea of a network economy and an economy where they're partnering. So they partner with some of the biggest merino uh, wool growers in the world. So this is Dolly. You can directly track which sheep your jersey has come from. They call it the barcode. <laughs> and what they've done is, um, they're not quite there yet, but what, so, so, so we can do this by tagging with this barcode, that's really, really straightforward. But what they're starting to, to notice is there is a revolution. And this revolution, this is William Morris, would have been horrified. This is the Luddite movement. And ironically, technology is gonna save the artisan industries. Because through a thing called Bitcoin and the blockchain, we can now have a public ledger of which company has put money into your product. So you can track the sheep, you can track the dyes, you can track which other partners have contributed to that final end product, and then make sure that they're acknowledged and remunerated properly. So this ability to really use this currency, this cryptocurrency from a technology perspective is actually freeing up a lot of artisan businesses, ironically. And so blockchain is starting to become one of these things that you know who's provided the leather, you know who's provided the um, dyes, and they can all be acknowledged in the public blockchain, and therefore we can make sure that they get their monies back in the right place. One of the places this is really taking off is Somalia. So Somalia has something like 97, 98% um, smartphone usage. They've started using M-Peso, it's a mobile uh, cryptocurrency on their phones, and they're using it for a lot of interactions now. There is very little money exchanging hands, which means the bribes, the small bribes, have absolutely plummeted. But it also means that people are now starting their own businesses, and they can be part of a bigger business and still acknowledge their role within it. So blockchains, I think, are going to be a really interesting design opportunity for design and technology to really think through how we can work together. Um, and what, what's really interesting, especially the Etsy story, this long tail, there's been so much of a focus in the finance world about building the behemoths. But the long tail is a horizontal behemoth. And there's a way of joining a lot of these small organizations up to create large economies. And certainly for a place like Rhode Island where we don't have giant companies anymore. 
but there's an enormous number of people making objects, technological objects, artisanal objects, that we can get out there. And if we can provide a network design opportunity for them, there's something we can do. Um, some of it's going back to um, Schumacher's theory of economics, and it's going back to small is beautiful. So part of this plea is also that design doesn't have to be an enormous thing. It can be an everyday thing. It can affect our everyday way of working. Um, and so if we are going to put humans in the middle, um, this is JR's work, can we be specific about the humans? Can we actually get more particular? Because now we have the technology to mass customize, to make something specifically for you. We can also have a route to your market. We can also connect you up to a, another part of our supply chain. So how can we think through design in that sense? Um, this is uh, Gillian Mercado. This, this is what um, Nick was alluding to about the White House conversation. So the White House is particularly interested in design for disabilities. There's a, a number of sectors in there, um, prosthetics for veterans. How do we think about disability? Because this notion of disability is kind of frightening because we think it's only one type. There are many different types of disabilities. All of us are disabled to a certain degree. This idea of an able-bodied person, I don't know about you, when I get up in the morning, my knees give me trouble. You know that there is this, once again, this idealized, able-bodied person isn't really out there. Even those swimmers at the Olympic Games, there is some form of different ability that they have. So the idea with this um, inclusive design, design for disability, is could we rethink disability in a much more particular way and think of it more about different abilities? So how do we design for different abilities? How do we actually take them into account and not demonize them? Wheelchairs are a frightening thing. It's a metal contraption that comes at, at you. Gillian is a, a world famous um, catwalk model. She has muscular dystrophy. Why can she not wear um, fashionable clothes? Why can she not look sexy? Why can she not actually represent her identity and her desires through her clothing? Very few, very little work has been done for people in wheelchairs. Just an example, I mean, if you all just put your hands in your pockets and try and pull out your keys or your wallet, it's really hard to do. We never design, we spend more time designing for, for cycling than we do for people in wheelchairs. And so trying to encourage people to, to think about this area and think more specifically about this area because technology does have an input. And for some of you, especially on the sort of the online stuff, this is Liz Jackson who's championing inclusive design fashion collective. Um, hearing aids, just, just simple little gestures at the moment, but hearing aids all look remedial. Yet Beat have made headphones look cool. Why can't we actually get Beat to make hearing aids? So there's a number of sort of provocations in this area about how do we actually design for humans without making them feel that they're not human. And so think about these different abilities. There's a lot of work, we're, we're do, trying to do some work at RISD around dyslexia. Most of us have some sort of sight reading disorder. We, we are all on a spectrum. So thinking about dyslexia, thinking about dyslexic signage, just little things that you can take back to your work that people are going to be reading, whether it's online, people's eyesights are not as good as we think they are. Writing in capital letters does not always help. So just those simple thoughts that you can bring can help inclusive design um, reach an audience. Um, so that's kind of like a real trot through of a number of topics. I just wanted to poke and hopefully leave some flowers and dragons and th for you to remember. Um, the title that Nick gave me was The Interface Between Design and Technology is the Human. Um, it is us. We are, we are in the middle of that and we are rationally irrational and we're irrationally rational. We are this lovely combination. It's what makes us rich. And so it's, it is really about embracing the humanity in it and trying to sort of design for that. And the challenge is, um, this is sort of one of those classic things that, can anyone see a Dalmatian in there? If you look specific, try and unsee it. It's really hard to unsee the Dalmatian. So once you've seen the Dalmatian, it's so hard to train yourself to unsee it. Yet that's what you're gonna have to do if you're gonna try and look again at your audience or at design in your organization or creativity. And that ability to, to really sort of, to pay attention, to really pay attention, to look and see something different. That's the opportunity, and I believe every human has a, a, the skills to do that, but we need to work on them. We need to pay attention, and we need to pay attention to ourselves paying attention, and then we need to really pay attention. 
because I genuinely believe that we are creative to the core. I think creativity is not a problem. It's our discipline around it that's a problem. And I do believe that you can find inspiration in everything. And if you can't, you should look again. So that's, that's it. That's really just sort of a quick, and hopefully just some seeds of ideas that um, I hope some, some stick. And with that, I'd just like to say hello and thank you. <laughs>